Well, good morning, everyone. Actually, if you're on the East Coast or someplace else in the world, it may not be good morning. But uh, if you're Western time or in the middle of the country, good morning. Uh, we are really pleased to have you here. Welcome to the uh, Dupree Center webinar. Uh, we're delighted that you're with us and looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, in, in case you're not sure why you're here, this is the webinar with Todd Bolsinger focusing on the topic of resilience in a permanent crisis, uh, practices for Christian leaders. And that's what we will jump into. This is uh, sponsored by the Max Dupree Center for Leadership at Fuller Seminary. The Dupree Center uh, really wants to equip you to respond faithfully to God's callings in your life and leadership. And we do a wide variety of things, creating different resources, uh, daily uh, devotion we email out each day, uh, events and uh, online events, especially these days, and, and uh, things like this webinar. And our point, our purpose is really to help you uh, respond to what God's doing in your life and help you be the leader that God has called you to be, whether you're in the marketplace or in the church or in other kinds of context education, we are here for you to help you in your leadership. And so that's what we're about today. Our uh, guest for today's webinar is Todd Bolsinger. Todd is a vice president at Fuller Seminary. He is the founder at Fuller of the Leadership Formation Division, which, as the title suggests, focuses on leadership, the kind of thing we're doing today. He's also been greatly involved in the, uh, the building of the Fuller Leadership Platform, which we'll explain a little bit about later. Todd was a pastor for about 20 years, and during that time, exercised leadership, but began to study it and write about it. Uh, many of you will know Todd from his best-selling book, Canoeing the Mountains. Uh, some of you will know him from his most recent ebook, a short ebook called Leadership for a Time of Pandemic. And uh, we'll hear more about this in this time and also a new book that's coming out uh, fairly soon with Todd. But uh, we're excited to have Todd with us to talk today about uh, resilience in a permanent, quote unquote, permanent or uh, parenthesis, permanent crisis practices for Christian leaders. Let me say one more thing before we get Todd going. Uh, we will have a, an extended time of Q&A uh, later in this webinar, and any place along the way, if you have a question, go ahead, open up the Q&A function and let us hear your question, and go ahead and log it, and then we'll try to get in as many questions as we can. Uh, so please, as we're going, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, that's not in the chat place, but that's in the Q&A place. So, uh, I think we're, oh, the other thing to say is that uh, many of the resources we're going to mention during this time, we have on our website, the Dupree Center website, that's D-E-P-R-E-E -E dot org, Dupree dot org. And if you go there, the first article up, you'll see it right away, says resources from the webinar. So that'll be a good place for you to see things. So anyway, uh, Todd Bolsinger, we are thrilled to have you with us today. Uh, to talk about resilience in a permanent crisis. Uh, welcome. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for welcoming me. It's nice to do this with you. Yeah. So, Todd, um, I think there are a bunch of us who look at this title and we say, resilience in a crisis, okay, we need that. Do we have to say permanent? Like, what <laughs> is that about? You gave us this title, uh, even though it's in parenthesis, we're not very happy about that permanent word. Do you want to talk a little bit about where, where you got that and what that means? Yeah, so I was doing a bunch of work um, with mostly pastors and nonprofit leaders on, you know, how do you endure a crisis and how do you go through it? And I found an article by uh, Ronald Heifetz. And so the folks who know my work on Canoe in the Mountains know that I refer to Ronald Heifetz's work a lot. And he has um, something on leadership in a permanent crisis. And of course, it has that parentheses around permanent. And so I looked at it and I realized it was from 2009. And what he was addressing was the aftermath of the 2008 recession. And he was referring back to the 2001, the 9-11 catastrophe and talking about how, man, we probably are never going to go through another experience like this where we have within a decade two big crises on top of each other. And I was realizing a decade later, or less than a decade later, we were in another one, even bigger than everybody could imagine. I mean, let's, let's face it, between a pandemic, an economic recession, protests uh, against racial injustice all happening at one time, it 
one of the biggest problems is how do you lead in a time where the very speed of change makes you feel like you are in a permanent crisis? And, and that's the notion. It's what is now normal for most leaders is that the only thing constant about change is that it is speeding up and we're in it all the time. Okay, so we got to deal with the permanent thing. Well, what about crisis? You know, I, I mean, obviously we can talk about the, the, the economic crisis or the pandemic crisis, but when, when you use the language of crisis and when Heifetz uses that, I mean, what, what are you really talking about? Well, what's interesting about Ronald Heifetz for folks who, who know, him, know his work is that he was a medical doctor. And so he would talk about the difference between being in an emergency room where literally everything has to stop and all you're doing is trying to save the life of a patient. And then the aftermath of the, of the emergency room, like what happens when the next team comes in and the group starts working, we're no longer in emergency, but we might be in intensive care or we might be in long-term care. And so what he was pointing to, it's just a good frame, I think, for many leaders. There is a moment when we are all in kind of an acute crisis. That's what many people experience. I've talked to pastors who literally said that the weekend where they all had to decide that all the worship Sunday morning services were all going online. And if you go back and look at what people said at that time, which was like for many of people, it was around March 15, they said, well, at least hopefully we'll be back by Easter. <laughs> right? like, like they couldn't imagine Easter online. Well, now we look back at that and think, well, isn't that quaint, right? So now to be in the first day of July and realize that for many of us, this has been an ongoing experience. You can't function like you're in emergency room mode all the time. And what people often do in an acute crisis is they just want to weather the storm. And they'll ask, they'll say stuff like, how do we get back to normal? When will it get normal again? And the, actually the dread people experience in leadership is, well, what if it's never going back to normal? What if this acute crisis is actually an enduring crisis. And how do we then think about leading through that? And that's the challenge that we have today is thinking about crisis in a way that isn't just about keep, how, can our organization survive, but indeed, how can we learn to thrive through it? And how can we grow through it? Well, that would be a question, I think, on, on the you know, the lips of many of us, uh, especially as this thing has dragged on. I mean, you're right. I, I remember when we were, you know, debating about whether we were going to, uh, we had a retreat planned for late April. And we're like, well, it's, you know, it's early March and maybe by late April, it'll all be great. And, and now, uh, you know, you and I are both in California, which is, in, in fact, we're in Los Angeles County, which is in like every news story because it's going so badly because of course, a whole lot of our friends and neighbors are all going out to the beach and hanging out, although they've shut the beaches for 4th of July. But uh, so it is a crisis. It, it, it feels like it's going on and on. And as you say, it's really not just this particular crisis. This is just the, the biggie that we're experiencing right now, along with the biggie, as you mentioned, of the, the whole issue of racial injustice in, in the United States and in some ways throughout the world. So. So my question then, how can this possibly be something that is good for us as leaders and for our organizations? I mean, how, how can we think about this? What can we do to turn this from just one gigantic long bummer to something yeah. that's really uh, going to be a, a, an opportunity for, as you say, thriving, for growth, for flourishing, mm -hmm. for changing uh, for repentance as needed for whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? What can we do? Well, for one of the things, the, one of the very best things we can do is acknowledge that crisis is an opportunity. It's a severe mercy, if you want to use the phrase that C.S. Lewis talked about. It is really an opportunity for us to address things we might not otherwise address. Um, it's, Heifetz literally says in the article that it's an opportunity for you to hit the organizational reset button and especially to address what he calls legacy beliefs and legacy behaviors. The kind of things that just have endured unconsciously forever in the, in the life of an organization that now we're now needing to address. So, so let me just give you one small example. Whenever I coach pastors, which I do most of my work is with pastors, as you know that, I'm trying to get them to say, stop talking about when we open the church again. Like that frame alone, we're closed, now we're open. The church is not closed. Start instead talking about 
what is the strategy we're going to use to utilize our buildings? Like buildings are a tool, they are not the church. But the mental model of the church is if we don't have the campus open and if we don't have our sanctuary open and if we're not doing our programs the way we did them well, then somehow we're closed. Well, that just, this gives you a chance to reframe the notion of what is church? And I, I, the question I keep thinking about, youth, youth workers, right? What is youth ministry if you can't have a youth group? Like youth groups are a tool. Youth ministry is a mandate, right? There's like all these things that give us opportunities to look deeper at the kind of larger questions that we have not addressed. And I think that's especially what's happening in the issues about systemic racism. It's helping us think through default behaviors that many of us just didn't even notice that now we're having our brothers and sisters say to us, you need to notice them. Here's your opportunity to learn about them and be aware of them and address wow. them. That's, that's so interesting. And that notion of the, the church being closed. So, some years ago, you know, Google, if you, if you look for a church on Google, um, it'll actually tell you whether the church is open or closed. It'll be like red letters, you know, closed. And many years ago, I was, when I lived in Texas, we were, I was going to go to Max, the, the church of Max Lucado was a pastor of amazing church. And for some reason, Google on Sunday morning had churches closed. So I wrote this completely tongue in cheek uh, blog post, kind of like the onion about how bad it is for churches to be closed on Sunday morning. And I got the communications guy at that church <laughs> so upset with me because he didn't get it that it was meant to be. Was a joke. But the, yeah. But yeah. What a great, I mean, when is the church going to open again? Well, I, obviously we're thinking, you know, worship services yeah. and, and getting together, but what does it mean for the church to be open even when we can't come together? And, and so, yeah, so dealing with legacy assumptions about who we are. And yep. okay, so if you're a pastor and you're leading a church or, or a, you know, a, you're a lay leader in the church, you're an elder, you're somebody who cares yep. deeply about your church, you're trying to help your church through this and grow in this and deal with these things, what do you do? Well, and this is true for you know all leaders. I think everybody who has a business is asking mm -hmm. the same question. And everybody who is trying to figure out what is a faithful response to this crisis that will enable us to live out our mission. So one of the first things you do is you have to recognize that this is the moment to get really clear on what's essential. Like what is essential for us? What is the thing that we're not gonna lose? Uh, what is the thing that we are going to hold on to? Because if we stop doing it, we, we lose our identity. So this is a good gut check moment. And, mm -hmm. and this is hard because all of us have a lot of things we would want to say are essential. I mean, mm -hmm. for years, I would say that, you know, being essential as a teacher meant that I'm a talking head and I need a classroom. Well, now as a, a professor, most of my teaching is online. And I just, I have an entire group of doctoral students who are working on adaptive change. And we, are, we had to cancel our in-person cohort and we're doing it all online. So now the answer, the essential is teaching, not classroom. And that's, and really that's hard. That's really hard. And so when we start getting clear on what's essential, we can start now asking some larger questions. And what we also find interestingly enough is, we, is, is if we focus on it in the right way, it'll actually give us energy to endure through the challenges. Um, the most difficult part for us isn't the external challenge. It's our internal resistance uh, of uh, resistance in our organization and ourselves from the from actually the will to face the challenge in front of us. Mark, you're muted. We need Paul to unmute you. myself it says oh yeah. thank you paul by the way i i just i want to thank paul matsushima who's in the background who's making this all work because if todd and i were just on our own here this this would not be happening be so be we, we've got some great help. well yeah and, and let me re, let me remind folks by the way that as, as you have questions along the way anything occurs to you uh go ahead and you can begin to put your questions up in the q a uh part uh, you, you see at the bottom there's a little Q&A, you can click on that. You can add some questions. We would love to uh, get your questions and we'll deal with them uh, uh, later on. So just want to remind you about that. Well, so Todd, uh, you, you talk about resilience and I think we have some sense of what that is, but do you want to talk a little bit? First of all, what do you mean by resilience? I know you've done a lot of thinking about this and then let's talk about resilience 
in the crisis and what we what we can do to become resilient people and resilient leaders. Yeah, so one of my, I mean, I did a bunch of research on resilience because when I started, um, when my first book, uh, my most recent book, Canoeing the Mountains, came out, it was all about leading to change. And what I, what happened was, as I started talking to people, um, I started getting people saying, you know, this isn't, the hard part isn't learning how to lead change. I had a pastor look at me and said, I don't, I don't doubt that I can learn how to lead change. What I doubt is whether I can survive it. Like, it's really hard. Like, I'm not sure if I'm up for it, if I have the stomach for it, if I can go through the conflict of it. And what, and so I started researching about resilience. And one of my favorite quotes on resilience is from an author named Andrew Zolli, C-O-L-L-I. And he says, it's maintaining your core purpose and integrity in the face of adversity and changing circumstances. Maintaining your core purpose and integrity. And Mark, you know me pretty well, that maintain is not a verb that actually gets me up mm, in the morning. That's right. That's like, true. Like, like it's, it's not, but this is interesting because you start thinking about resilience as the the steadfastness of holding on to what's most important and so i start thinking about people who say you know we want our business to succeed because we want to give this service to the community we want our church to be here because we want to witness to the community we want our organization is making a difference i mean we have a friend who does an amazing like the work with you know children and families with down syndrome like how do these nonprofits make it to these hard things? What you're discovering is there's resilience if you can hold on to your core purpose and integrity. And that that resilience is not just a matter of sticking it out, it's not gritting your teeth. It's actually something that is formed in people over time. And that that formation of resilience is really important in a day like today where we've got this ongoing uh, disruptive crisis. Yeah. So just to, to reflect back, really getting clear on what's essential, what's your mission, your, why are we doing what we're doing, and, and really hanging on to that uh, yeah. is, is what keeps us in, in the game and, yeah. and able to, to endure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah, so I would say that the two first starting points for resilience are one is the why. Why do we exist? What's essential? And the other is the who. Like what I've become really aware when you talk to people about resilience, they are willing to be resilient because of the people they're with. Like, you know, who are we shoulder to shoulder with? I was, I was in New Zealand and they talked about, they used a rugby analogy of what it's like to link arms and do what they call the hard yards. Like think about these rugby, you know. And I think that for me, the, the other part about this is how deeply important relationships are. And, you know, it's, it's, it's important. It's, it seems fun that you and I are having this conversation. Like you are my oldest friend. And so much of my resilience as a leader is because of our friendship and that we get to have these conversations all the time in a way that allow us to think about how we can together be faithful to what God has called us to do. And that's hugely important for people. Yeah. Which by the way, I mean, that, uh, I mean, we're, you know, you talk about practices and I want to ask you about that, but one of the practices that I, I mean, it's it just, absolutely essential in any time, but especially in this kind of time, is to have a few people who are really journeying with you. And, yeah. you know, the people you can be completely honest with, the people you can say to, you know, I, I just want to quit, you know, or I just <laughs> want to, you know, I want this all to go away, or mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, so depressed, I don't even want to get out of bed, or whatever yeah. it is, a a as well as the people that then you can you know, dream with and, and, and ask hard questions with. And, and, and so, mm -hmm. um, so I'm sort of answering the question I was going to ask you, which is, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about practice? Yeah. But I would say yeah. from my own experience, one of the huge gigantic practices is uh, the, the practice of community. You did kind of write a book on that a few years back. Mm -hmm. So I started stealing it mm -hmm. from you, but do, do you want to talk about practices to help yeah. us yeah. be resilient? Yeah, so think about this. Um, so I would say that if the very first set of commitment, the very first practice is getting really clear on what's essential. Like, you know, why, do, why, why is this worth enduring? That's a really important. And it can't just be institutional survival. I, I was with a leader once who said, who said, you know, our mission is just to survive. I said, no one's going to support that. Like, no one cares whether you survive. They care whether you your survival impacts their life. So I had a Silicon Valley person say to me, literally, um, you know, nobody cares if your institution 
survive. They care if your institution, your organization makes their life better. So that's the first thing. The second thing then is the, really the practice of developing sets of relationships. And I always say that, you know, you need to have partners. Those are people who share the ministry, the work with you. You need to have mentors. Those are the people who are behind the scenes coaching. Everybody should have a mentor. Everybody should have a coach. I would say to my, you know, my students, my doctoral students, they go through an entire year of the cohort where six months of the year, they have to be either with a spiritual director, a therapist, or a coach. And they have to be intentional about it. And so you have to have, men you have, to have partners, you have to have mentors, and you have to have friends. You have to have people who care more about you than they care about the mission. They care, they care deeply about you so that they can be the ones who literally help you have the gut check of, are you supposed to kill, still do this? Is this good for you? Is this good for your health? You have to have all three of them. And then I think there are some practices that you can begin to use that will form you for leadership. And that formation is an ongoing process. Um, one, one of our friends asked, you know, what if you think you don't have resilience? Are you too late? <laughs> well, it's like any practice, right? You start doing it now slowly and the practices get better. And there's some specific ones that I think that are helpful for resilience. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, 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 I'm guessing that you must have seen that question over in, in the chat. And by the way, let me remind folks, you can say whatever you want in the chat, but if it's a question and you want it to get answered, it's good to put it in the Q&A. However, that this was, I think, a really great question. What would you say to leaders who feel like they haven't developed resilience Yet, they need that resilience now to lead. It can feel like it's too late, but, but is it? In other words, you know, you realize, oh my gosh, I'm not, I'm not ready for this. I am already yeah. exhausted. By the way, I want you to talk about exhaustion, so yeah. keep that. Yeah. I'm already exhausted, and I just read yesterday that, that LA County, you know, we set the record for the most new cases, and, and, and this and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be done. You know, I'm ready for the flattening of the curve. I'm ready to be. So what do you say to folks who say, I, I don't know that I built in the resilience. I mean, what can I do now? Well, the most important thing to remember is you don't learn to be a leader until you're leading. Like there, you can't, like, this is why, like, it's the irony that I teach leadership classes, right? But so, like, you can't take a class on leadership, write a paper on it, and then be ready for leadership. You don't start learning to lead until you're leading. So the very fact that you acknowledge that, I don't know if I have resilience, means you're on your way. Because the very first practice for developing leadership is learning. You have to become a lifetime learner. You have got to think the goal isn't to somehow learn something. Then when I have resilience, I'll lead. No, you're going to learn it all the time. So, so the first thing you have to do is recognize that the very mindset of being humble and teachable. And I just think of, of humility and teachability as being the same thing. And what's great about that is it is that openness to learning, the ability to stand before a group of people and say, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're in this together and we're going to keep going, is really the first step, not only to leading, but developing the resilience for leading. So it starts by acknowledging that it's normal. It doesn't, no, no one's an expert. And especially today, nobody is an expert on what we're facing today. Nobody has in, in the world today has led through a pandemic, an economic recession, and a set of uh, worldwide needed protests about racial injustice at the exact same time. So if anybody tells you that I'm the one who can solve it, they're lying. Like this is, this, the leaders have to be people who can learn as you go. Well, that'll either be a great encouragement to our listeners or we just lost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so depressing when I talk about this stuff. People are like, wait a minute, isn't this going to get over soon? No, no, no. It's but, not gonna get over soon. <laughs> but the encouragement then really is for someone who says, uh, I, I don't know that I've developed the resilience. You're saying that that acknowledgement is, is actually the best place to start. Exactly, exactly. People who, are res who have resilience are people. Um, there's this great imagery that Jim Collins talks about in one of his books. He calls it the Stockdale Paradox. It's a great story. You can just Google that and look it up. About Admiral James Stockdale, who was the long, highest ranking and longest serving POW in the Vietnam War. And what he said was the key is acknowledging that for people to survive through those kind of ordeals, they have to be, have to confront the deep, brutal facts of their condition, the truth of it, and 
have somehow a belief that this will be the best defining moment of their life, that they would someday never switch, n never give up. That, that's not Pollyanna. That is deep commitment to the enduring belief that, that for me is my faith, that God, nothing is wasted in the reign of God, that God uses everything for our good and God uses everything. It's, I mean, that's hard to say when you've been through a lot of things, but that God is present in all of that. Yeah. Which, you know, I, I mean, as you know, Todd, I spent a lot of my life studying Paul. And, mm -hmm. and he's one of got to be one of the most resilient Christian leaders ever. I mean, that list of all the terrible things he endured in Second yeah. Corinthians and beatings and shipwrecks and, you know, all that. And most of us can't get close to that, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 but he talks about that as, as an occasion to uh, acknowledge his weakness and in mm -hmm. his weakness to know God's strength. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I mean, my, it seems like in, a, in normal life, if things are going okay, you can, of course, believe that. You can preach that. But you don't really get at it until the time when you really feel like you're exhausted. You're spent. You don't have, and yeah. then all of a sudden you really need God's strength. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, that's easy. So, yeah, we, we're getting some questions, and I want, I want to get in as many as I can. Again, to uh, folks who are listening in, if you want to uh, ask a question, um, uh, please put it in the Q&A. So let me just, let me just they're, they're good ones here, but let me just start at the top. So David asks, how do you decide between changes required for the crisis and changes which may be more important for the long term? How do you balance those wanting to say that the crisis change should be the long-term model and those who want what we had before. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that's great. So, so I would basically put it this way, which is the very first thing, you know, um, that you have to ask is, what's our mission, right? Like, what, what is our mission? What is, why do we exist? What is our reason for existing? And then literally being willing to say, once we're clear on what will never change, can we be open to letting everything else fall by the wayside? Can we be open to changing everything else? So whenever I hit a moment, especially when you get a moment where you are going into what, I, what we call uncharted territory, the answer isn't just survive the crisis. I mean, the answer has got to be, can we believe that this is the moment that God allowed us to go through, or we, are, we find ourselves in, that we can allow to shape the deeper issues that we wouldn't face before. So example I often use, uh, this has been so helpful for me to think about this, um, COVID attacks bodies that have underlying conditions. So I think about this all the time, right? My dad is 77 and it's homebound. And if the wrong person walks into his living room, he will die. He will get it and die. He had these underlying conditions, uh, diabetes and other things, COVID exploits. So now he needs to be hyper vigilant about being healthy. But the rest of us can look at ourselves and also say, so what are the underlying conditions in my life that I need to address so that I'm not exposed to this? And I think this is one of the questions that the church needs to ask a lot. And there have been some prevailing underlying conditions that seem to be coming to the surface through this moment that you can now ask yourself, what are the things about our organization that we couldn't see before, but now we can, and that we need to pay attention to. And that's what we, that's what, those are the long-term adaptive challenges, the underlying conditions that this has brought to the surface that now we're looking at. So, so the crisis itself then really creates an opportunity for deeper learning. Yeah, it's, that's, yeah, that's great. Hey, um, so a friend of ours, Michelle, is asking a question and says, uh, I love that you frame resilient leadership as posturing oneself as a learner, because we're just talking about that. Can you dive more deeply into the interplay between how a leader proceeds in essential things with confidence in the time, in, that with the confidence these times require, uh, but a confidence that is also tempered by the humility that is equally critical. So we want to be able to trust our leaders and they need to exude a certain amount of confidence, but we, we want the humility you talked about in the learning. So how do we do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, thank you, Michelle. Um, Michelle is a good friend of ours and uh, her 
himself is one of the just best thinkers about these things. Um, so, I, you know, um, I would basically put it this way, which is our confidence has to be in our belief that we are doing something worthwhile and in the people who are around us, not in our innate capacity. Like, like well, this, is a, this is a hard paradox. This is the vulnerability of leading into uncharted territory. It's literally, you know you're in an adaptive crisis when you have to literally stand before a group of people. And when they say, what do we do? To tell the truth, you have to say, I don't know. And at that moment, there are folks who are gonna walk away from you. They don't wanna be in a learning process. They don't wanna be in a growing process. They want a quick fix solution. They just want anything to happen. And what you have to do is, Hold the reality that we're going to we are going to hold together, and we are going to learn through this. And in learning through this experience, we are going to grow. So the confidence is not that I have it perfectly figured out. The confidence I have is that we will grow through this, and that we will do so by being humble and vulnerable and honest. And that is this is why this is hard. I, I had so many pastors say to me, I, "This has been the most interesting refrain." They said, "I thought the hardest decision I'd ever make as a pastor was canceling Easter." That's the way I'm right. Canceled Easter, as if our not having a service somehow took away the resurrection of Jesus. But that's what it felt like. We're going to cancel our Easter services. No, today the hardest thing they're facing is the decision about when to start services. Way harder. Why? Because at this moment we can't give you anybody any guarantee that any strategy is going to work and everybody is divided and conflicted. So the hardest thing is the internal conflict where you've got to pull people together and say we're going to have to make our best decisions we possibly can based on our deepest values and we're going to have to be able to lead into that future that is unknown. Great, thank you. Let me, uh, let me just go with another question. Rachel asks this. Can you speak a little more about how to start the process of addressing and reflecting upon legacy behaviors or frameworks, specifically thinking about the idea of the church being closed, without that process being skipped over or dismissed, which seems to be the tendency? So how do you do this thinking about the legacy stuff? Yeah, so one of the questions, one of the ways to do it is to literally get people to make observations. So, uh, so in the process that we teach about teaching adaptive leadership, we say that everybody wants to go to intervention. They want to ask, they want to get as quick as possible to what should we do? And the first question you actually have to ask is, so what are we seeing? And so this is in, um, in the work of adaptive leadership, they'll talk about looking from the balcony and listening on the floor. And those actually happen to be two key practices for resilience. One is learning to look and see the, the system, see the larger thing. So I would say, get the leadership together and ask, what are you noticing? What are you seeing? What are you aware of? What are, the, what are the larger systemic issues? So many churches have come and said, hey, we've begun to realize that if we're not going to have a gathered sanctuary, if we're not going to be built around uh, a choir and a preacher, well, then we need a distributed model of leadership. We need to be able to serve people in small groups and homes. And you know what? We don't have enough trained leaders. That's a systemic issue. So leadership development is a systemic issue that comes to the top. Then you start listening to people so that you can hear their fears and you can hear their resistance and you can attune to them. And listening helps us be attuned. And attunement accelerates change. People want to follow people who are near to them uh, emotionally, even as they're trying to look at the larger landscape. So the way that you get people through that is you get a group of leaders together and you say, let's look at the bigger issues, let's listen deeply to our people, and then let's start doing some experiments. We're going to experiment our way forward. Um, I always say to people, try, try not to predict the future. Don't predict. Prototype. It's, it's from our startup friends. You know, do a small experiment. Try a small thing. See what you learn from it. Do the next thing. Just keep prototyping your way forward as our Pal Dave Evans would teach us to do. Yeah, that's so interesting. You know, it, it just strikes me, Todd, that I, I've spent, you know, I, I've been a pastor, although I'm not in a church now, I'm now at Fuller, but I've been a pastor for a lot of years. And one of the things we, we try to do over and over and over again is tell people, you know, the church isn't the building, right? The church really isn't the building. Where the, 
And now all of a sudden we've got this opportunity. <laughs> we can't even go to the, <laughs> you know, and it, it, it does feel like it's an extraordinary opportunity. At the same time, most of us would say it wasn't the building, it's the body of Christ, it's the people of God. And, and, and now we're feeling um, in, in many ways separate from that. And, and so yeah. it just, it forces us to ask really deep questions and then really think through what does it mean to be the people of God in this season? I just want to put in a little vote for Paul, who again, wanted to maintain strong community with people from whom he was distanced. Uh, and, and, you know, he didn't have the internet. So yeah. he basically took letters, which at the, in that time of history were not, they were not used for community formation in the way that he used them. And he sort of created this thing out of familiar stuff to do what was really essential, which was to build relationships, to build community. And, and we're kind of in a Pauline crisis in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I would say Paul, Paul was sheltering in place and was trying to figure out how do you form people over distance? Yeah. And he used the technology of his time, a letter and the Roman road. And, and he also used relationships. He sent the letter with a trusted person, right? Right. And so, so that combination, I mean, your, your scholarship has done so much on this, Mark, that Paul was a pastor, right? And that he thought, he thought about his people as being really dear to him, but he was continually innovating because of, his, of the urgency of the gospel. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we got a, a Hope is asking a question, and I want to uh, give this to you here. She says, as we think about adaptive ministry, i.e. youth ministry versus youth group in a building, what are the challenges that you see in mm -hmm. regards to personal relationships? For example, session meetings on Zoom, uh, elder meetings for those who aren't Presbyterian, yeah. uh, elder and church leader meetings on Zoom versus uh, meetings in person have an entirely different tone, in her opinion is not helpful to building the body of Christ. So again, adaptive ministry in a time when we can't be physically together. How do you, how do you think about this? Well, this is, um, first of all, thank you, Hope. She's actually, Hope is an um, amazingly creative pastor in Florida. And um, her, her, she's always doing these interesting things. And what's interesting about this little, this little piece, Hope, is you're asking me this question, but the last time I saw you, was at a gathering that I was flown across the country to speak in your presbytery, and you and I saw each other briefly over lunch, right? And so one of the reasons why I like, I like this question so much is it reminds us that the ministry is complex. It's always going to be personal. It's always going to be personal. But a bunch of us are discovering there's ways of using technology that are good, and they're using ways of technology that are, are not going to be so good. And so, you know, Patrick Lencioni made this great statement. He was against all the technology stuff until he had to. And now in his podcast, he said he believes that in the future, we're going to use technology for more of business. And we're going to hold face-to-face -face for relationships. He said people are going to get on, not going to get on planes to go have business meetings as much. They're going to do that over Zoom. They're going to get on planes to see their grandchildren. They're going to get on planes to be the friend. And one of the things is I'm going to say is I think we are going to need to keep thinking about high tech and high touch and appropriate high touch. And, you know, in the day of social distancing, that doesn't mean I can actually touch you or be close to you, but I can emotionally attune to you. I connect to you. We can create ways of being together and we need to. So we are, we're going to have to think more and more about leveraging technology in the places where we can. I mean, as Presbyterians, but, you know, just imagine a day where there's no more two hour session meetings. They're all done in 35 minutes on Zoom because we have to deal with the business. But then we actually find ways to engage each other personally around prayer and spiritual practices and friendship and meals um, when, when it's appropriate when we can. Uh, hey, Todd, I got a question I got to ask you uh, from a youth uh, leader, a youth minister in Texas named Allie. <laughs> who asks, uh, with the unknown of the future, how do you as a leader not freeze until a decision is made, but instead move forward? And then how do you get out of that freeze that occurred at the beginning of the crisis? 
Oh man. So Allie is my daughter. So everybody knows <laughs> who is uh, one of my favorite youth directors. Um, so, you know, so Allie, I mean, I mean, one of the questions that you and I both know, we talk about this a lot because your mom is uh, one of the most attuned uh, therapists and coaches that we know is that the freezing is normal, right? That's our anxiety happening. And so when we, when we're freezing, so, you know, what, what do you do with stress? You freeze or you flee or you fight. And so, you know, so some of us may freeze up. Others of us just might start getting like overly involved, fighting our way through. Some of us might just run away from it. What you have to do is calm down. So one of the very first parts about being an adaptive leader is you've got to manage your own anxiety and you manage your own anxiety by acknowledging it. Right? Like, like, I hate feeling dumb. When people ask me, hey, so what do we do? And I have to say, I don't know. Oh, internally, something in me says, well, I should have known or I should know. So what I've got to do is manage my own anxiety. And then what you start realizing is that when you're open to being a learner and you're open to being vulnerable and saying to people, hey, let's learn this together. Not only does your anxiety start to come down, but you get to break what Ed Friedman calls that imaginative gridlock when we're stuck. And teachability um, overcomes imaginative gridlock. Humility and honesty does. So the way you stop getting stuck is by managing your own anxiety and then experimenting your way forward. Don't have to do big things, do small things. Do one small experiment on your way forward. Learn as you go and learn, and as you go, take with each step, learn what you can. You've got to take, take two steps back, take two steps back but manage your anxiety and learn as you go. That's great. Hey, uh, we've got a, just a little, about 10 more minutes and we've got a bunch of questions. So I'm going to try and get through uh, as many as we can. Uh, Kyle, Kyle is asking this, how do we address the potential conflict that may arise when returning to in-person meetings between congregation members who have different beliefs regarding the politicized nature of this current crisis? Uh, for example, some people don't understand the need for wearing masks and will potentially endanger lives by attending a service without one. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this is so, this is amazing. And wherever you sit on this issue, you have a tendency to be hunkered down. So here's what I would say. What leadership teams have to do is figure out the value that is the most important one. So if we say, okay, we're all going to wear masks because we're going to, we are going to uphold the law. That's an important value for us. We're going to do that. Or we're going to wear masks because we are going to love our neighbors and our most vulnerable people. Or we are going to listen deeply and we're going to make decisions. And then you'll have to just be willing as you make the decision, you're going to have to deal with the heat of people who disappoint you and who are disappointed in you. There's just no, the only way to go through conflict is to stay calm and is to stay as connected to the people who are disagreeing with you. But then you have to stay the course. You have to be really committed to the decisions that you've made. And in almost every church where I see pastors getting pressured, they're getting pressured by well-meaning people who want an exception to a policy that could literally put people in danger. Thank you. Okay, another question from Patricia. Can you comment on openness or transparency with stakeholders, congregation, staff, community, not necessarily re-COVID, although it's a good example. So how, how transparent should leaders be? Well, this is, so this is very hard. If you're a person who lives in an environment where there's not high trust, then transparency can be difficult. I, I've talked about this in a lot of environments where I have been challenged by particularly women and younger leaders and leaders of color who have said, when we're vulnerable and transparent, people use it against us. So this isn't about being naive. I, I acknowledge that. So the first thing I'd want to say is you need to be honest with yourself and you need to be transparent with trustworthy people. And then you need to get people around you, leaders and others around you, who will enable you to be transparent publicly by protecting you from that. So in, in that middle of that. So I, I you know, um, Stanley McChrystal, who's in the military, he literally said he believes you should be as transparent as you can right up to the place of where it's illegal. <laughs> like you should share everything you possibly can. And that's, you know, so you don't violate personnel issues or something like that. But what it re relates to is how vulnerable it is and how much, not a thing, uh, how much you need to create environments of trust to be that transparent. Mm. Thanks. Let me, let me press on. Um, 
Uh, Jennifer thanks you first off and then says, what about building relationship with people who are not comfortable mm -hmm. with or don't have access to technology? Yeah, yeah. So I think about this all the time. For one thing, people are getting more, people are getting more um, comfortable all the time. My grand, my mother like, is 78 years old. My mother would not get on Facebook. We would just tease her. We would say, mom, we'll get you an iPhone. We'll set it up. You want to be on Facebook, see all your grandchildren. But she got on Zoom because her grand, my niece, her grandchild got her on Zoom, bought her a Chromebook, put her, set her up, did it for her. I think there's going to be tech ministries in the life of churches where it's going to help people get on technology. Yeah. So now my mother at 78, she will proudly say she's a Zoomer and that she gets all of her PEO ladies on Zoom and especially the older ones need help. <laughs> and I think there's a way of thinking, helping people through technology is like helping people through anything that they feel vulnerable to do this. So we, you know, we have Paul to help us, Mark, and we just need to have other people help us. When I travel, I think I should always have an 11 year old taking care of all my technology for me, but yeah. we're going to live in a world where we're going to have to help people through it. And then we're going to have to figure out how we care for people who aren't going to connect to it. Yeah. You know, I think of my daughter, Tati, as you know, is a school teacher in a district, in a tough environment. And they realized, they, the school realized, oh my gosh, there are a lot of our people who don't have an internet at home. They can't go to the coffee place anymore. And so they actually literally had to serve people to help them get online to provide what they needed. And, 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 and so for the church, that would be kind of an analogy. Uh, yeah. So, Right. I think technology is going to be necessary. I mean, yeah. we're going to have to figure out how to do it as a society and as a group. Awesome. Okay, let's keep going. We've got, yeah, we got about six more minutes. Uh, how can we as leaders not give in to anger and bitterness against the people who are trying to serve in the church body? When we see those same individuals that are actively aggressive against wearing masks, saying racial injustice doesn't exist, and creating harm within the church body. If <laughs> guys answer that, there's no way. I give it to anger and bitter. No, I mean, I mean seriously. I mean, what do we do with that? So that's, this what, is, by the way, that's from Tiffany. And thank you for that yeah. question. That's a yeah, great Tiff question. Tiffany, it's, I think it's the most painful thing for leaders. I do. Le uh, Ed Friedman talks about a failure of nerve, which is when leaders lose the courage to keep moving because they collude with their people to go back to status quo. But I've discovered, and we talk about this in my new book, about a failure of heart, which is where we get cynical and disconnected from our people because we get so disappointed in them. And you see an example of this in, in uh, Moses in Numbers 11, where he literally says to God, if you're going to leave me with these people, strike me dead now. Right? <laughs> so, so I think to acknowledge that it's normal to take it before the Lord and to literally get, again, other people around you to help you live out your calling to love these people that have been entrusted to your care. That's our, our good friend, Scott Corbett, was talking about that. These people have been entrusted to your care. Now, how am I faithful to them? This yeah. is, I think, a vocational challenge for us as leaders. Yeah. Well, and, and you sort of said it. I mean, I, I mean for me, I, uh, anger and bitterness make total sense, but anger often is sort of the first emotion. And underneath that is hurt or disappointment. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and so, and, and, and to acknowledge that and even to, and, and to take that to the Lord, like you said with Moses, I mean, to say, Lord, I mean, I've been shepherding these people and, and now look and, and you feel so disappointed yeah. Uh, yeah. and to acknowledge that and start with it rather than trying to mm -hmm. deny it or, you know. Yeah. Okay. We got a couple more. Um, Della asked this. When 7 billion people on earth want equal share of wealth, social recognition and opportunity. I feel we do not have energy or time to share with all inhabitants, especially when you're on the, uh, you are on the older side, say mid 70 and older. How do you deal with the demands of the world? Yeah. Yeah. Will you solve that please? Yeah, really. No, that's I, a I great, can't solve that. Yeah. There's a good example. Question. That's a good example. Let me, let me just model for you. I don't know. Yeah. But here's what I do know is that the scriptures call me, to figure out how to care for the least of these. And the scriptures call me to love my brother and sister in need with tangible things. And the scriptures call me to love my neighbor. I don't know how it works, but I know I can't get away from those commands. Yeah. So, so Todd, I know you've written on this, but 
you're doing all this stuff and and then sometimes i i just can't i'm just had it you know i i'm exhausted and i even if i want to go on i feel like i can't go on and and i think there are a lot of folks in that mode now so what how do we deal with the exhaustion mm-hmm. yeah so um, I, had a, I literally had a pastor say to me the other day, my inbox is a terrible place to be. Like he just, he was just, I could, even on Zoom, I could see the exhaustion in his face. And, um, and, and I'm reminded of this quote by David uh, Steindl Roth. He's a brother who was talking to David White, a poet. And he says, you know that the antidote to exhaustion is not necessarily rest. It's wholeheartedness. So my answer to exhaustion is yes, if you need a nap and if you need a break and you need some time off, oh, please take it. Please do take it. You need it. You'll need, if, if you need rest, your body's telling you you need rest, take it. But you will not come back and, and then be, you'll still be exhausted until you are able to wholeheartedly give yourself. I mean, he, he says half-heartedness will kill us. And I think that's where a whole bunch of us are. We got into being leaders because we want to be deeply connected to people who are joined together for a cause, and now we're doing Zoom calls. We became youth people because we wanted to care and love kids and take them on trips and take them on mission trips and do events. And now we're trying to get them on Zoom and they think that Zoom is school, right? We, we find ourselves half-hearted about what we're doing. So learning to be wholehearted is really important. And I think you become wholehearted by again, getting clear on what is essential and also getting really, figuring out how to overcome and stay as connected as possible. So like, I just found that Zoom calls are getting exhausted. So I'm picking up the phone and calling people more. If I can walk outside and call a friend, uh, it changes my day, but I need the connection. And then I just think we do need to, this is the point about experimenting. We need to creatively experiment. I get wholehearted when I'm learning something and when I'm discovering something. And we got to figure out a way to turn our organizations into learning communities that are always discovering and adventuring. Todd, we're getting right near our time, and I'm I'm feeling bad about the questions we're not going to be able to respond to. But um, I also know that people can get a hold of you if they want to, and they can yeah. do that through the Dupree Center website or at Fuller. Um, you want to just share any concluding thoughts? Uh, and, and then I'll wrap up in a couple of minutes, but you have a couple of minutes of just what, what would you say to those of us who are, <laughs> okay, what, do, what can we take from this? What, what do you really want to give to us? I think if I can say anything at all, I could say that I believe that every single person, especially if you're sitting on a seminar like this and you're thinking about leading, I want you to believe in your heart that you are called into leadership for such a time as this in exactly the context you're in, in exactly the challenge you're facing, Mm. that this is yours to do. This is kind of your burning bush moment. This is the opportunity that each of us have in whatever little place we are. I said, wherever our little corner of the world is, that we're to participate in what God is trying to do in terms of restoring justice and righteousness. It's, It's to be the answer to the prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And in this little place where I'm called to lead, I'm going to commit to that. And I believe that is a, that is worth your lifetime. It is worth my lifetime. It's worth generations of lifetime. It's worth my life and my daughter's life. And that work, we need all the resilience we can so that we can be faithful to it. In the Mishnah, uh, the Jewish Mishnah, there's a phrase where they say, um, this is not your work to complete but it is also not yours to abandon. You have to be faithful to what you're to do and you're to hand it over to faithful people. Mm. Well, Todd, thank you. That has been a great conversation. And again, I want to remind folks that if they want to get um, many of the resources that you have, including your, your books and podcasts and webinars and stuff, if they go to our website, uh, the, the very first article on the very first page is basically uh, pointing folks to resources that we've been talking about here and, and a few others like our the, the Life for Leaders daily devotion we produce in, in the Dupree Center and, and some other resources we have for you for folks. So if you go to the Dupree.org, you can find a lot of more, uh, a lot of good stuff and helpful stuff 
uh, including the book, Todd, that you have out right now on leadership in a time of pandemic. And if people are interested, they can pre-order uh, Tempered Resilience, which is your next book coming out in November. But Amazon will let us all like order it now. So if, if you're interested. Um, and uh, so that's at our website at Dupree.org. And we would, would love to be in contact with you. Uh, if you have any further questions or want to, you know, learn more about what we do, I mean, check the website out, let us know. We'd be glad to uh, uh, be in relationship with you because we're, you're the reason we exist. We are really here to help you live out your life as a leader, live out your calling faithfully in every day, even and especially in this time. So um, that's pretty much it, though. I, I actually want to pray for just a moment. I know in webinars, you don't usually pray, but you know, we'll just deal with that. So uh, let, me, let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time, for these people who have gathered. Thank you for Todd and the wisdom you've given him, his passion for leaders, his passion for your church. Lord, you know these are hard times. And as we have even said in this conversation, we, we really recognize and experience our weakness, our exhaustion, our uh, lack of wisdom. So we look to you for strength and guidance we pray, Lord, that you will bless our churches in this challenging time, that we won't be closed, even if we can't all gather in the way we would like to gather, that we will learn and grow and really contribute to your work in this world. And Lord, we do pray for those who are dealing with the crisis of this pandemic. We pray for leaders across our nation and then across the world who are dealing with the crisis of racial injustice. Uh, the economic crisis and all the other things that you would guide us and that we in our part of this world would be faithful and would honor you and be used for your purposes. Again, we thank you for this time. We thank you for those who have been with us in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mark. It's really fun. <laughs>